Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. The dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence as we continue to study of the statements in the spirit of prayer uh, regarding the time that we are living in. And we just ask that um, your Holy Spirit can can guide our minds and um, be with us in our discussion, that you can have words that will encourage and help each one of us as we seek to know you better. Thank you for the Sabbath and the blessing of it, the blessing of fellowship. We ask for your care and protection for our family, for the problems and difficulties that uh, seem to overwhelm us, Lord. We pray that you can give us a faith and a confidence that you can take care of these things and that miracles will be done. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, happy Sabbath again, everyone. Now, I do have a new computer set up here, so it's a little bit confusing how I got it set up. It's different than what I had before. So we've been reading through The Crisis Ahead by Robert W. Olson. This paper, as I've mentioned before, was something that we studied in the upper room, uh, which was our Bible study group back in the 80s. So it's it's nice to go over this again. There's lots of statements that uh, uh, sort of have shaped my Adventist experience. And so I think it's, it's a good idea for us to look at these. So we're dealing with... Um, these statements, these questions with answers. Um, so dealing in the time uh, before the close of probation, there's a question that uh, Olson asks. He says, how will some young people be treated by their own parents? So conscientious obedience to the word of God would be treated as rebellion. Blinded by Satan, the parent will exercise harshness and severity toward the believing child the master or mistress will oppress the commandment-keeping servant. Affection will be alienated. Children will be disinherited and driven from home. So obviously the relations between all kinds of people uh, will be affected in this, this testing time. So we know that we can't, we're not going to stand together necessarily as families, but, you know, Jesus says, I've not come to give, bring peace, but a sword. You know, father shall be against his, his son, you know, mother against her daughter, right, et cetera. The enemies shall be the enemies of their own household. So it's something that's obviously um, not everyone's going to, you know, that we love and care for is going to accept the truth. And then this next one, how will some be dealt with by judicial courts? All who prove their loyalty by obedience to the law of Jehovah must be prepared to be arrested, to be brought before councils that have not for their standard the high and holy law of God. And, and I don't think it's just going to be about uh, the Sabbath. I think, obviously, there's lots of different issues that um, when a person stands for God, for the truth, that the courts may not treat them well. And you know, I can think of my own situation when uh, um, dealing with uh, my children and and the government child support laws and so forth in in Canada, where adult children who are making bad decisions that you still have to support them financially, that the government takes control of your child's life, so to speak. They decide. <laughs> even though they're not children, they're adults. And, but there's lots of injustices that occur within the judicial system, the justice system. I mean, it's a legal system, not necessarily a justice system. And we would expect that these injustices will continue, not just because, because well, we would say that people who, can, who represent God will be mistreated in the court system, right? That Satan has his hand in it, the prejudices and and biases that exist. So to expect justice from man, you know, as we get closer to the end of time, it's just not going to be the case. And, and we see that corruption of the legal system that's been happening uh, more and more, and, and the politicization of the legal system on both sides, you know, of the aisle. The tender mercies of this power will be displayed in prison cells, and dungeons. Already preparations are advancing 
and movements are in progress, which will result in making an image to the beast. I'm not sure what that means. The tender mercies of this power will be displayed in prison, prison uh, because it's sort of taken out of context. So that's from the Review and Herald, uh, April 23rd, 1889. So I'm actually going to go see that statement. Anybody understand what that statement means? Maybe read a sentence or two before it again? Well, yeah, that's why we need some sentences before. We don't have that context. Okay, I'm just not looking at my screen. Yeah, so all we have is is two sentences. Um, so I'm not sure the tender mercies of this power, uh, what exactly that's talking about. So, so review and herald, 1889. It's one thing I hate about compilations. <laughs> but back then, you know, it was really, you know, we didn't have E.G. White disc or anything like that. And so a lot of these statements were, you know, most people didn't have access to them, you know, unless they had the Review and Herald volumes. Uh, so April 23rd. Okay. So it uh, says, parents, ask yourselves, ask yourselves the solemn question. Have we educated our children to yield to paternal authority and thus train them to obey God, to love him? to hold his law as the supreme guide of the conduct and life? Have we educated them to be missionaries for Christ, to go about doing good? Believing parents, your children will have to fight decisive battles for the Lord in the day of conflict. And while they win victories for the Prince of Peace, they may be gaining triumphs for themselves. But if they have not been brought up in the fear of the Lord, if they have no knowledge of Christ, no connection with heaven. They will have no moral power and they will yield to earthly potentates who have assumed to exalt themselves above the God of heaven in establishing a spurious Sabbath to take the place of the Sabbath of Jehovah. The tender mercies of this power will be displayed in prison cells and dungeons. So that's the way I took it is it's like it's sort of it's a sarcastic uh, statement, right? So obviously... It's not really tender mercy. That's what I figured it meant. Already preparations are advancing and, and movements are in progress, which will result in making an image to the, to the beast. Events will be brought about in the Earth's history that will fulfill the predictions of prophecy for these last days. Okay, so, yeah. So, you know, almost she should have put uh, tender mercies in quotation marks. As the defenders of truth refuse to honor the Sunday Sabbath, some of them will be thrust into prison, some will be exiled, some will be treated as slaves. To human wisdom, all this now seems impossible. But as the restraining spirit of God shall be withdrawn from men, and they shall be under the control of Satan, who hates the divine precepts, there will be, a stri there will be strange developments. The heart can be very cruel, when God's fear and love are removed. So, I mean, you know, when we think about uh, the pleasures of sin for a season, right? We can think about the consequences of, of disobeying man, right? So that we, we can say, oh, I need to submit to this power because otherwise, you know, I won't be able to eat. I won't be able to care for my family. But that power is not a loving power, right? And and so, you know, it's not just that that um, you know. Obviously, we know that God's people will be punished, right? In a sense, right? They're going to be thrust into prison and so forth, and that there's going to be this awful restraining spirit of or this this uh, restraining spirit of God removed so that we can see this awful treatment that's going to happen when that occurs. But those who are following Satan, they also are not going to be having a good time. So the ones who will actually be better off are the ones following God because they will have peace with God. Right? You know, so there's, you know, so sometimes we think about the consequences in, in a very limited and short-term sense. 
it's hard to, to place eternal realities in a situation. So it's something that we need to learn to do, which trials help us with. Look at the patriots and prophets and see how they dealt with that. Yeah. Is it possible that some may make the supreme sacrifice? There is a prospect before us of a continued struggle at the risk of imprisonment, loss of property, and even of life itself to defend the law of God. As he influenced the heathen nations to destroy Israel, so in the near future, he will stir up the wicked powers of earth to destroy the people of God. Men will be required to render obedience to human edicts in violation of the divine law. Those who are true to God will be menaced, denounced, proscribed. They will be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinfolks, kinfolk, kinsfolk and friends, even unto death. Now, I, I've sometimes said, you know, it's, it's easier to, to die for God than to live for God. But, you know, of course, I haven't had any experience in dying. But um, the fear of death can be something that uh, can only be removed by knowledge of God, by clear conscience. I mean, people might think, you know, as Peter said, you know, I will not betray you even. In, I can't, can't remember exact words, but, you know, willing to even die. Right. And of course, he didn't realize that, you know, what what was inside of him. And so, so we really do need to recognize that what's coming upon this world is something that we need God. You know, we don't just, you know, for many people, God is just kind of a, a belief and it's something that sort of guides you a little bit in life. You, you know, you prefer to believe in God. It gives you comfort. You know, you go to church, but you live generally your life for yourself. And, uh, but God's asking all of us, right? He wants the whole person. And and that may mean, you know, dying. Right? So so it's it's quite a it's quite a commitment to be a Christian. Will those who are condemned for their faith be afraid of the prison cell or even of death itself? If we are called to suffer for Christ's sake, we shall be able to go to prison, trusting in him as a little child trusts in its parents. Now is the time. To cultivate faith in God. Yeah, this, this statement and the other ones from I, Our High Calling. We are not to have the courage and fortitude of martyrs of old until brought into the position where they were in. Should there be a return of persecution, there would be grace given to arouse every energy of the soul to show a true heroism or heroism. Now, when you think about that, so we don't have the courage and fortitude of martyrs, right? Because we're not in that situation. But if we are in that situation, God can give us that grace. Right? So he can give us something that we don't now, now have. He gives us the things that we need when we need them. So even if we try to anticipate how terrible things might be and we think I can never go through that, God can bring us through it. He's so self-confident like Peter. We don't want him to do that. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. So, I, I, I mean, one is we need to recognize our need of God. I mean, if we're in a situation where we think we're okay, oh, yeah, I'll have no problem doing that. Uh, it's going to make it more difficult. But we know the disciples were not endowed with the courage and fortitude of the martyrs until such grace was needed. So God gives us the grace that we need, the power the peace when we need it. And, and I think that's an important point, but it's because we know him now and follow and choose, choose to follow him now and to obey him that he can give us that grace. Right? If, if, we're, if we're not obeying God, when those times come, uh, we will not have the faith uh, to trust in God uh, to carry us through that experience. I believe he also gives a, gives us trial situations where we are required to stand against the crowd um, so that we can look back to that experience and uh, trust him for the future because he was there presently 
I, I, one example comes to mind. But I worked at a sawmill that was a union shop, and I really needed the job. When I applied for a job, this last thing I did was slide the union card across the table, and I said, "Well, I don't. I'm not going to sign that. I don't have to." Well, the union rep got quite upset with me and went out and got the sawmill manager. The sawmill manager says, "So you don't have to sign?" I said, "No, I have a religious exemption." And uh, he got this smile, of, you know, and the union rep got mad, and the sawmill manager got happy. And for at least six months, every day, at least once a week, the union, the head of the union, the shop steward, <clears throat> would come down to my workstation and try to convince me, pressure me to sign that card. And, uh, it didn't take long for it to spread around the sawmill too, that I was a scab. And, uh, that was, God gave me this, not like prideful courage, but it, it, I didn't flinch. I just knew whether I lost my job or kept it, but mm -hmm. I just trusted God in the situation. And I've seen others like that since. Yeah. And in this pres present situation right now. Yeah. Did you tell him, you know, the reason why I don't join a union is for the very attitude that you have, that unions have, is sort of, <laughs> I, you probably didn't tell that to him. Not but, exactly, but. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, it's just I, like, like, you know, why would it's you join uh, some what, group going to bully people? It, it was interesting that. Um, Took a took a couple of years, mm -hmm. but I I became good friends with that union steward. We would visit together. Right. So it was interesting. When, for the truth's sake, the believer stands at the bar of the unrighteous tribunals, Christ stands by his side. And when one is incarcerated in prison walls, Christ ravishes the heart with his love. When one suffers death for his sake, Christ says. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and have the keys of hell and death. Revelation 1 8. The life that is sacrificed for me is preserved unto eternal glory. That was from Desire of Ages 669. Who will be the devil's most efficient agents in the misrepresentation and accusation of Adventists? Men of talent and pleasing address, who once rejoiced in the truth, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. Yeah. So those that once knew the truth, what two powerful Christian groups will unite to persecute the advocates of truth? The professed Protestant world will form a confederacy with the man of sin, like the papacy. The scriptures teach that popery is to regain its lost supremacy and that the fires of persecution will be rekindled. Many will plead that there is no prospect that popery will ever be revived. If it shall regain its lost ascendancy, it will be by Protestantism's giving it the right hand of fellowship. If it shall be legislated into power by the concessions of time-serving men, the fires of persecution will be rekindled against those who will not sacrifice conscience and the truth for the heirs of the papacy. Once let the minds of the Christian world be turned away from God. Let his law be dishonored and his holy day trampled upon and they will be ready to take any step where Satan can lead the way. So these are things we all know, of course. Church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and in this work, papists and Protestants unite. All who will not bow to the decree of the national councils and obey the national laws to exalt the Sabbath instituted by the man of sin to the disregard of God's holy day will feel not the oppressive power of popery alone, but of the Protestant world the image of the beast. The popular ministry, like the Pharisees of old, filled with anger as their authority is questioned. 
uh, will denounce the message as of Satan and stir up the sin-loving multitudes to revile and persecute those who pro proclaim it. So proclaiming this message of the Sabbath. Protestants are working in disguise to bring Sunday to the front, as did the Romanists. Throughout the land, uh, the papacy is piling up her lofty and massive structures, in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions are to be repeated. Um, will this persecution be in be uniform everywhere? As long as the message of mercy is to be given to the world, there will be a call for effort on, in behalf of other institutions and enterprises similar to that for the relief of our schools. As long as probation continues, there will be an opportunity for the canvasser. When the religious denominations unite with the papacy to oppress God's people, places where there is religious freedom will be opened by evangelistic canvassing. If in one place the persecution becomes severe, that the workers do as Christ has directed. When they persecute you in this city, flee into ye into another. If persecution comes there, still go uh, go to still another place. God will lead his people, making them a blessing in many places. Were it not for persecution, they would not be so widely scattered abroad to proclaim the truth. Of course, we saw this in the early church. So, uh, I mean, obviously, it may be hard going from country to country, but we I, I've done lots of door-to-door uh, -door work all throughout, uh, you know, the area in which I live, different parts of the city, different towns. And the one thing I can say is that uh, towns have characteristics. You know, you can have some towns that are people are really friendly and other ones where they're very closed and uh to, you know, to strangers or people they don't know. And so, you know, there's obviously going to be opportunities to go places uh, with the gospel. Not everybody, it's not going to be uniform. That is, is this persecution going to be uniform? And it will not be. So places, ways will open up. So it'll be interesting to see how this unfolds for each of us individually. How will unsanctified church members be affected by the storm of ridicule, trial, and contempt? As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition by uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit. They have come to view matters in nearly the same light, and when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. Of course, we're familiar with this quote. Now, you know, one of the the arguments, you know, that uh, we have regarding, you know, the idea that we need to stay with the church, stay with the ship, the ship will go through, is that it's pretty clear that it won't be very clear who to follow as this time approaches. Um, in a sense, what, what we're going to have is a type of civil war within the church, and so some people think if you stay with the institution, with the church, somehow that, that that's how you're going to be saved. I just, I need to stay with the church. Whatever happens, uh, the church is going to be on the right side, the institution, right? Because they have a belief that, that the church, Seventh-day Adventist church, is going to go through. But we know that that can't be the case, that, it, that an institution can't save us, right? It's our connection with Christ. And that's the only safety is to be obedient to Christ, to follow the truth. And yet for many people, it's not just, you know, out there in the world, but within the church, they see they've, they've all already are worldly. They've already come to view matters in nearly the same light. Right. And, 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 and often they don't recognize this. They can think that they're conservative, that they're reformers, that they're, uh, true-hearted Seventh-day Adventists, but but they've been following the church, right? They've been following the group rather than knowing God themselves. And so when the test is brought, they're going to be on the wrong side of it. How will the true sheep react when persecution comes? When the storm of persecution really breaks upon us, the true sheep will hear the true shepherd's voice. 
Self-denying efforts will be put forth to save the lost. And many who have strayed from the fold will come back to follow the great shepherd. The people of God will draw together and present to the enemy the united front. In view of the common peril, strife for supremacy will cease. There will be no disputing as to who shall be accounted greatest. So, so this spirit, we can see the contrast. Um, and, and I really like this part when I remember this. I've always thought a lot about it. Those many who have strayed from the fold will come back to follow the great shepherd. Now, of course, we know the story of the lost sheep. But to me, it's something that, uh, that I've seen many people leave the church, not because they didn't believe the truth, but because the truth was not practiced in the church. And I, I'm not saying that, that that was the right thing to do, right? And, and some of them, you know, aren't necessarily following God in, in all the ways that they should. But when they see a living representative, a living representation of Christ, when they hear that message, they will be drawn. They are lost sheep, but they will come back into the fold. And, and some of those will be, you know, our children, you know, for us older people who have children, that, Amen. you know, they, they weren't treated well in the church. And so they hadn't seen, you know, it represented properly and maybe even in you to some degree, but mostly it's, uh, you know. Or I saw they, the hypocrisy in the church. <laughs> yeah. I support them. In the yeah. I, because they took a stand that sprays. Yeah. And a child doesn't have, you know, even, even when they're just like a young man, they don't often have the experience to really understand it. And sometimes, you know, it's even the way uh, that they, you know, some of my kids, I know it's the way that I was treated by the church, which is why they don't believe in Adventism. I remember going with uh, Josh being only three years old, maybe four, and asking him driving by, um, driving by the church, and not my, not not central. It was actually Warburg Church, the pastor there, Dennis, whatever crap. Yeah, and, crap. Uh, and I asked Josh, I said, hey, you want to go see your friends? No, oh, Turner Boys. No, I don't want to go to that. I don't want to go there. That they kick my knees. And yeah. I was against it, wasn't it? Was yeah, so his mom got kicked out. Yeah. Yeah, I know, and that really affects children. Well, you know, my oldest son, Matt, he, uh, he's a highly sensitive person. He looks really, really tough, you know, dressed in his army fatigues and his short hair and uh, all of his mannerisms and everything. But, you know, he was the, the gentlest child and, and very sensitive to God and nature. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure the main reason he's not an Adventist is just of how he was treated by many people in the church and how he saw me treated by the church. So there's not an attraction for him to the church. And he held on to Christianity for quite a while, but eventually that sort of faded. Um, but you never know what can happen in, in his life as time goes on, as he sees things unfolding. So, you know, that's why we pray for our children and we try to represent Christ in all that we do. What mighty demonstration of the power of God will be seen throughout the world after persecution begins? The love of Christ, the love of our brethren, will testify to the world that we have been with Jesus and learned of him. Then will the message of the third angel swell to a loud cry, and the whole earth will be lightened with the glory of God. So uh, when we look at the statement, there's also lots of things that aren't included here. So... It's not about that the right words are said, right? That, you know, that we've somehow formulated a message and uh, we found a package that's going to be effective, right? It's not the machinery of the church or of an organization. It's not that we have really good YouTube videos or um, that we've done a really uh, good public evangelism campaigns and good advertising strategies and, and created a bunch of small groups and 
and all kinds of things, right? The things that that churches or organizations to do do to try to spread their message. But this is going to be the love of Christ as demonstrated in the love that God's people have. That is going to be th the thing that testifies to the world of the truth of the third angel's message. That's what's going to help it swell to a loud cry. Now, when we think about 9-11, right, as Revelation 18, when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down and joins with the third angel, right? So the mighty angel of Revelation 18 is the second angel's message, which with additional uh, additions to it because of the sins of uh, the Protestant world being part of Babylon. And it also has a call to come out of her. So when we think about that message, do we think about love? You know, what, you know, how do we look at the second angel's message? Does it look like a message of, about love? You know, now obviously love is, is it become a degraded word in, in our vocabulary. It doesn't have the meaning it once had. But this call to come out of Babylon, it is an invitation of love, right? Amen. And, and it is tied to, you know, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Right. These two messages are again repeated in our history. Right. So Ellen White clearly says that the parable of the ten virgins has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled to the very letter. Right. In our time. And that the second angel's message of Revelation 18, that second angel's message is repeated. And obviously you can't have a third without a second. You can't have a second without a first. So we know the first and second angel's messages are repeated. In, in order for this third angel's message to swell to a loud cry. And so we have this prophetic message, which has been handled by this movement, I think, uh, with rough hands. That is, I don't think that the movement has represented the message that it professed to be, to be giving. And especially we saw how people were treated within the movement. That, that that demonstrated that we didn't have an appreciation of the message. And so it had, had no power. Uh, hopefully we can see that. And this isn't a, like a condemnation of other people and that we're better than them or anything like that. It's just the reality that, that we don't represent Christ and that we have to. I'm going to agree to that. Yeah. What should be our present attitude and conduct as we anticipate trouble ahead? Um, over and over, the message has been given to me that we are not to say one word, not to publish one sentence, especially by way of personalities, unless positively essential in vindicating the truth that will stir up our enemies against us and arouse their passions to a white heat. Our work will soon be closed up, and soon the time of trouble, such as never was, will come upon us, of which we have but little idea. Now, this sentence, this this I, what she presents here, can be misinterpreted, can be misconstrued, and has been, right? So obviously, we're not going to bring about undue uh, criticisms. We're not going to be trying to stir the pot, pot, create sensations. That's not the work that we've been given to do, right? If we think about it, the work that we've been given to do is to represent Christ, and how he did things. And so often what is done is people want to create controversy as a way of attracting people to the truth. Is that an effective way of presenting the truth? So no. Ten, tends to attract the wrong, wrong mindset. Yeah. And, and it also can bring about opposition that's it's not going to be helpful. Right? So to be as wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove, you know, to have discretion on, you know, to not say things that are going to create controversy, but to work for people, to, to bring the gospel to people. This, the only way that this can come about is if we are truly converted. If we have the heart of Christ in how we minister to others, it makes all the difference in the world. Let everyone bear in mind that we are in no case to invite persecution. We are not to use harsh and cutting words. 
Keep them out of every article written. Drop them out of every address given. Let the word of God do the cutting, the rebuking. Let finite men hide and abide in Jesus Christ. There is to be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. The time is right upon us when persecution will come to those who proclaim the truth. The outlook is not flattering. But notwithstanding this, let us not give up our efforts to save those ready to perish for whose ransom the Prince of Heaven offered up his precious life. When one means fails, try another. Our efforts must not be dead and lifeless. As long as life is spared, let us work for God. That's the end of that section. Okay, so we got this section number six, uh, the mighty sifting. Uh, what is the Bible teaching on the subject of the perseverance of the saints? Once saved, always saved. Is it possible for a genuine Christian to lose his love for God? Okay, so um, so dealing with the mighty shift, sifting, right? So we know there's a shaking and a sifting that goes on, right? There's this separation that occurs within the church. Um, so I guess the question that he's asking here, obviously he doesn't believe in once saved, always saved. But So we know that that people can turn away from their righteousness, right? That people can know God for a time and they can fall away. Correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So I think that's mainly what he's trying to show with these different verses. You know, so I look at Matthew 24, verse 13. Uh, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, right? And, you know, and, and we run into this with, um, you know, uh, Baptists quite a bit. You know, you just need to say the sinner's prayer, then you're saved, and you don't need to worry about your sins. And they, they want you to, to know that you're saved. Like, So I, I find this very strange because uh, I know some Baptists. And Heidi and I mm -hmm. had some dealing with a Baptist pastor and his wife. And yeah, they were quite great. forceful over this issue. What's that? Uh, I was going to say even stranger to me, I've been speaking with a fellow that basically Calvinism, but he doesn't know it's Calvinism. Okay. Predestination. Predestination, yeah. He's going to be saved. He believes he's going to be saved no matter what and leads quite a life. Yeah. That, so that doesn't testify to that. Yeah. But but the idea of this being saved, the one thing that these this Baptist uh, pastor and his wife is it's like well, you just need to believe on Jesus, you're going to be saved. So, well, we believe on Jesus. Okay. But then they say, well, then you're saved, right? So you believe you're saved. Well, not yet. I mean, I have those that endure unto the end shall be saved. Right? Um, that he that, you know, can believeth on the Lord Jesus, confesses him, he shall be saved is what the Bible says. It doesn't say he is then saved already and never has to worry about being lost, right? So even the verse itself that they use as their primary verse says he shall be saved, right? Because you see, it's, it's a future uh, situation. So it's something that we need to be aware of is that we can lose our salvation. Just because we profess to believe in God now isn't sufficient. Just because we're, we've joined a church and we've been baptized and we've, you know, paid our tithe and and then all the things that we think are required, it doesn't mean that we're going to be saved. And and some people don't like that idea. They want the idea that, well, I can just, you know, become a Christian and I should be able to have the confidence that I'm going to be saved. Now, what they're mistaking is is the confidence in God's ability to save, not the confidence in us, right? You understand what I'm saying? So so we can trust that God can save us, no matter what our situation, no matter how far we have fallen. God is able to save to the uttermost all that come unto him. Yet that's not about us. It's about God. And, and I still can make a choice to reject that salvation at any time. So, you know, so to me, it's it's pretty clear that, you know, obviously many people who have followed God and maybe even had an experience with God, right? In some some level, um, tasted of of God's forgiveness and mercy and felt His peace. 
can turn from God, right? So the, the next, um, you know, I'm not looking at all these verses, but uh, does the Bible describe the apostasy of any particular individuals who once had God's approval? And so, when, well, let's look at a few of these here. Um, so in Ezekiel uh, 28, verse 15, talking about Satan, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So Satan obviously fell, right? Now, a person could say, well, you know, we, we we're born in sin, and so once we're saved, you know, we, we're sort of saved out of it, and so we can't fall again. Um, Second Peter chapter 2, and this one, you know what that is. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, the preacher of righteousness. I don't know if that's the one I was thinking of. There's another, it might be a typo, because I don't think that's the verse that I would have, unless it's just relating to Satan and the angels. Maybe that's what that one's for. And then First Samuel. Uh, 10, verse 9. <clears throat> and it was so that when he turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. Right. So this is, um, so who's this, who's this talking about here? This is um, Saul, right, talking about Saul, I believe, in 28, verse 15. And Samuel said to Saul, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me. So the other one is when he was anointed by God, received the Holy Spirit, and he went to prophesy. And then this one is dealing with the fact that he's, the God's departed from him. Now, some evangelicals say, well, that was the Old Testament, right? So, so he must have looked at... Yeah, so I'm going to look at this other one in the earlier one, Second Peter 2, verse 20. For um, if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of Lord of the, our Lord and of the Lord and our of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. And the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Is apostatizing the shaking of members out of God's church, limited to bygone centuries only. The mighty shaking has commenced and will go on, um, and all will be shaken out who are not willing to take a bold and unyielding stand for the truth and to sacrifice for God in his cause. The angel said, think ye that any will be compelled to sacrifice? No, no, it must be a free will offering. I saw that we are now in the shaking time. Satan is working with all his power to wrest souls from the hand of Christ. God is now sifting his people, testing their purposes and their motives. Many will be but as chaff, no wheat, no value in them. We are in the shaking time, the time when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. The Lord will not excuse those who know the truth if they do not in word and deed obey his commands. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has begun already. The judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know what is coming. Even in our day, there have been and will continue to be entire families who have once rejoiced in the truth, but who will lose faith because of calumnies and falsehoods brought to them in regard to those whom they have loved and with whom they have had sweet counsel. They open their hearts to the sowing of tares, the tares sprang up among the wheat. They strengthened. The wheat became less and less, and the precious truth 
lost its power to them. What experience of the near future will greatly increase the number of apostasies from the Seventh-day Adventist Church? The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us. Those who have, step by step, yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be, rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. The contest is between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. And this time, the gold will be separated from the dross in the church. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. The work which the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity, she will have to do in a terrible crisis under most discouraging, forbidding circumstances. And at that time, the superficial, conservative class, whose influence has steadily retarded the progress of the work, will renounce the faith. Now, when she talks about a conservative class here, what does she mean, a superficial conservative class? Is she talking about the conservatives in the church? Or does she mean something? Some people just take this and say, see, the conservatives are the bad ones. That's a particular class. It's not uh, of the conservatives, I don't think. Okay. Well, a, a, a superficial conservative class. Yeah, yeah. So what does she mean by conservative? Is, is it good to be conservative in the sense that Ellen White talks about? Yeah, if God says it, God says it, then you believe it. Okay. So when we have, is it the conservatives, for instance, who reject the 2520? Well, yeah. Yeah, and I'm not talking Some... about like the conservative group, but I'm just talking about, that is, they're not open to new light, right? Conservative is somebody who preserves what they already know to be true. Right. So at, at the expense of any new light. Right. So they're superficial. They, they hold to the truths of the church, but they're not interested in, in an advancing light. But that's the way that I understand when she talks here about conservative. Uh, Many because don't even is, believe, believe in new light. Many the church don't yeah, believe in new yeah. light. So so I would say that this would be, you know, the. the you know, generally speaking, people who've just been Adventists for a long time, they're not they're not looking for anything different. They're not searching the scriptures to find out if they're wrong. They have a superficial relationship. And and anything that seems to them to be like new light, uh, they dismiss. Right. So they don't they're not interested in 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 new light. As trials thicken around us, both separation and unity will be seen in our ranks. Some who are now ready to take up the weapons of warfare will in times of real peril make it manifest that they have not built upon the solid rock. They will yield to temptation. Those who have had great light and precious privileges but have not improved them will, under one pretext or another, go out from us. In the absence of the persecution, of the persecution there have drifted into our ranks men who appear sound and their Christianity unquestionable, but who, if persecution should arise, would go out from us. So, so obviously we can see that um, persecution is going to be one of the things that separate. Um, many people join the church because it's an advantage, especially in, in lots of places in the world. It can be an advantage to be an Adventist financially. I know there's some countries where that's, that's the case. They, they look at it as, an opportunity to improve because the churches are, are quite powerful there and they may not have a place within, let's say, the Catholic Church or some of the other churches. And and, and so they need to belong to a church in, in order to improve in society. And so that's why some people become Adventists. No, don't. No, you know, can't judge individual people on that, that point. And some people become Adventists, you know, because, you know, it's a social group or whatever. But when persecution comes, we'll see that they have no root in them. So anyway, we will pick this up three weeks from now. I'm not going to be here for the next two Sabbaths. Um, so, uh, so we'll have a different study. But we'll come back to this study in, in uh, three weeks. 
So there will still be a study. Dwight still will have his study and and uh, I'll send it an email about the schedule. Okay, any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. A dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have had here. Thank you for the Sabbath. And we just pray for your continued presence in our lives. Help us to speak to you, to listen to your voice. We pray for one another. We know, Lord, that we haven't always represented you in the things that we do. But we've had harsh words. We've pushed people away. And we ask for forgiveness. And we ask that your, your character can be manifest in our lives. We know, Lord, that you have a purpose in all the things that have happened. And so we trust that you uh, can see these things through till the end. Help us to be a part of your purposes, to fulfill your will in us. So we give our hearts to you and we pray that this Sabbath again will be a blessing to each one. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.